Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday, May the 6th, 2021. It is currently 8.38 a.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm coming to you live from the middle of nowhere, Texas, also known as Ovalo, Texas, which is really in the middle of nowhere, Texas. But yes, that's where I'm at. I'm in Ovalo, Texas. I'm inside the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church. I'm here in the back of the sanctuary. I've got all the podcast equipment set up. I've got books all over the place. I've got bottles and bottles and bottles of water right here. See? Why do I say C? Why do I say C on an audio podcast? Yes, inquiring minds want to know, why do I say C, C? I, probably because I'm used to standing behind a pulpit, speaking to actual people who are sitting in front of me. So I, have, I, I, I do that all the time in, in my podcast. I'll be like, like I'm, I'm going to show you this, and I'll have my iPad, and I'll be, and, I, and I'm literally like, I'm holding it up to the microphone. Like, look, look, C, and you, you, you can't see. So I know some people say, well, why don't you do a video podcast? That's a good question. Uh, the reason I don't do a video podcast is because one, um, that requires camera. Sometimes you have to have a green screen. You got to have lights, and you got to have a setup that I don't have and don't want to invest money in. And two, I, from what I have discovered, now I could be wrong. That mo a lot of people listen to me while they're driving, while they're doing this, while they're doing that, and video. I guess you could just go to YouTube and turn on a video and go do something else. But I just like uh, I like I like audio more than video. Um, I just do, and I just think with an audio podcast, and you can just send that everywhere to every podcasting site that's not video. And uh, I, I don't I don't I just think it works better. Now sometimes yes, sometimes I wish I could show you something, but most of the time I think I can, I try my best to paint a picture with my words. Okay, maybe I'm not very good at that, but I try. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, however you may be listening. Thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen to the Theology Central podcast, where I do my very best to make Theology Central, to put theology right there in the center of the discussion. And as a Christian, theology should be the center of your life because you should be a student of God. And a, and listen, you must view everything in your life from the perspective of God, from the perspective of Scripture. You need a biblical perspective, a theological perspective to combat a world that does not have a theological perspective or a God perspective. And as a Christian, the struggle is that other perspective if it begins to, well, infect the way you think. So that's why this podcast is here, and hopefully you find it to be beneficial. Now, we've got a lot to do in this episode, so let's get to it. Let's start with this, all right? Now, I want to just give you a principle and give you an idea. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you will realize that no matter what the subject is, no matter what the topic is, there are multiple opinions within Christianity and within church history. And another thing that you will discover, which can be extremely frustrating and confusing when you're a young Christian, is that no matter what the issue is, no matter what the topic is, not only are there multiple different perspectives and views throughout Christianity and throughout church history, everyone has their scriptures that they will use to prove their point, claiming we're right, you're wrong. You just name the issue. Throw out, the, we'll throw out a topic. Baptism. You've got those who believe babies should be baptized, and they're going to go to their scriptures that seem that they believe ultimately should lead you to the conclusion that bab babies should be baptized. You have the other side going, wait a minute, if I go to scripture, I don't ever see a baby being baptized, and I see that the, the reason people get baptized is after they believe, after they receive uh, Christ, that's when they get baptized. Each side believes they're right. Each side will reference the scriptures as supporting and proving their perspective. 
You could have those who say you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. But then there have been those throughout church history who go, wait a minute, wait a minute. James seems to indicate we're not saved by grace alone, that it requires works as well. And so they'll have their verses. You'll have your verses. And you could go on Lord's Supper. Do we have closed communion, closed communion, open communion? Everyone will have their scripture supporting their view. Uh, how should the church operate? Do you do you need a denominational structure? Is the church supposed to be independent? Do you need a plurality of elders? Uh, how about a pastor-led church? How about a congregational rule? Like everyone has their scriptures supposedly proving their points. You can go on and on and on. It doesn't matter what the issue is. You can find different sides. And again, let me make this very clear: all claiming that the scriptures support their side. And one of the reasons this happens is sometimes in Scripture, you can find verses that seem to indicate this, and then you can find verses that may seem to indicate something different. In other words, they appear to be in conflict with one another. So how do you harmonize those Scriptures that appear to be in conflict with one another? Well, Guess what? Not everyone's going to agree on how to harmonize harmonize them, and everyone's going to attempt to harmonize them and probably going to come to very different conclusions. And this continues to happen. It's happened throughout church history. It's going to continue to happen through church history. Now, some people can reach a almost a, a they 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 find themselves almost in a the pit of despair. They just they're just like, you know what? Nobody can figure out what the truth is. Nobody knows what the truth is. So it doesn't even matter. And they just get frustrated, give up, or just say, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna believe what I want because everyone's everyone's got their own opinion anyway. So who cares? And I know that there's a temptation to just get so frustrated and just feel defeated. But I will say this, the goal as for a Christian is our job as Christians to constantly be opening up, opening up God's word, trying to figure out what the truth is. And when we find these situations where there appear to be verses going one way and appear there appear to be verses going another way, we have to humble ourselves and constantly, constantly be re-looking at the situation over and over again. In other words, whatever conclusion you come to today Whenever you study that subject again in the future, you cannot use the conclusions you came with in the past. The conclusions you come with today are of no value in the future. We have to constantly be re-examining, constantly be re-studying, because we realize that whatever conclusions we come to, those conclusions were, were arrived at by fallible people. We're not infallible. We believe Scripture is infallible, but we are fallible. So I come, I study a subject, I study a scripture, I study a passage, I come to a a conclusion today, and I have to proclaim that conclusion. Like, okay, this is what I know right now. But that doesn't mean when I study that passage or that topic tomorrow, that I'm going to rely on that conclusion. I've got to study it again, trying to lay aside every conclusion I've come to in the past and look at it anew, look at it again, and be challenged to to try to find the truth. Now, that may sound exhausting. That may sound frustrating, but it's just the reality. We have fallible human beings who pick up, who hold in their hands, who read the infallible word of God. And we already know that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So we're dealing with the infallible word of God. We're dealing with the word of God and we are holding it in in our hands. And those hands are connected to people, you and I, us, who have fallible minds. We, we, uh, we make mistakes. We don't know all things. We don't understand all things. And so therefore there's always a danger that the conclusion I came to today, you know, yesterday should not be the conclusion I arrive at today. It has to be rechecked and relooked at. And that means there's constant, I think in some ways a Christian is constant in a state of flux, trying to find truth, realizing that maybe a past position was wrong and and, and you move forward. And I know that sounds like you're being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I know what that, that sounds that way. I think the point is we want to find the truth, grab onto the truth. We just have to acknowledge that our understanding could be flawed. We have, if we don't, if we don't acknowledge that, then we become arrogant 
And I think at that point we become blind of ever truly finding the truth because we think that we we already have uh, we already have it all. So I think you don't want to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but you want to constantly be st- checking the doctrine that you have that you have studied in the past and study and and you want to re-examine what you have believed to see if it needs to be changed, modified, or completely rejected. So um, it, it's. I know people don't like this, but it's just the reality. It's just the way it is. And there are there is one subject. Well, where well, there's a, we could put we could, I could pick probably fifty examples. But for this episode, we're just going to look at one subject, one example. We're going to look at four views attached to this topic, and then. I'm going to give uh, some books away. We, we, we're, we're going to be somewhat limited in what we can give away, but a listener sent a check the other day, so I'm going to use some of that money to give away a few copies of this book. So we have a lot to do, and I, and I hope that introduction will at least— I, I mean, I think if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know. You, you meet other Christians, you're like, wait a minute, how can you believe that? Well, they're looking at you. How can you believe that? And both of you will start quoting Scripture— and both of you will arrive at completely different conclusions. That is frustrating. It, it has bothered me my whole Christian life. It should bother you, but it's just the reality in which we live, and so we have to constantly try to navigate that reality, right? But let's get to the subject for today, all right? We'll, we'll, let's read about this subject. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. You know the scripture, Exodus chapter 20, where we have the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we read these words. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Stop right there. All right. Now, that's Exodus chapter 20. This is the idea of remember the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. And this brings up the subject of the Sabbath day. Now, you know, throughout history, there are those who believe the Sabbath is on Saturday and it still must be followed and it still must be obeyed. But you look around and at, at the world of Christianity and clearly the majority don't hold to that view. They believe Sunday is the day we worship and that it's not a Sabbath and we don't treat it as a Sabbath and that we're not bound by those rules that were just art, that were just kind of hinted at there in Exodus chapter 20. And then there's other, obviously we can go to other parts of the Old Testament to talk about the restrictions and the rules on the Sabbath day. So there are those who say, no, 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 the Sabbath is still in effect. It's on Saturday. There are some who say, no, the Sabbath is still in effect, but it's on Sunday. And there are those who go, no, Sunday is the day of worship, and we're not under any Sabbath rules. But it, it, that introduced the subject. You know, in fact, let me just go back to it and read it again. Exodus chapter 20. I don't want to say it uh, incorrectly. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, Now, some will say, so the one commandment that says to remember something is the commandment everyone forgets. I understand that. And it it is somewhat ironic that the commandment here, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is is the one commandment that a lot of people say it no longer is binding. And in a sense, we can forget it. So how should we understand that? So you got Exodus chapter 20, you start reading in the Old Testament, you talk, you hear discussions about the Sabbath, discussions about the Sabbath, discussions about the Sabbath, you know, this is the punishment, this is the punishment, and you start reading all about that. And then you get to Colossians chapter 2. You get to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we read these words. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Now we're in the New Testament, Paul writing to a New Testament church. 
And what does he tell the, the church at Colossae? What does he tell them? Colossians 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink. There's the dietary laws. Or in respect of a holy day um, or of the new moon, nor of the Sabbath days. Now, some will argue Colossians 2.16 has nothing to do with the Sabbath. It has something to do with all those additional days and all of those other additional feast days and holy days and dietary laws. That what Paul here is not referring to the Sabbath, he's referring to those others. And, and, but, and others will say, wait a minute, no, Colossians 2 is telling me, you can't judge me on which day. You can't, you can't place me under some bondage to go back to the Old Testament Sabbath. Paul here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, no, no man can judge me according to that. Why? Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Those things were picturing something that was to come. The fulfillment has come, so no longer we're not binding under that. Others will say, no, that's not referring to the Sabbath. That's referring to those others. So some will go to Exodus 20. Some will go to Colossians 2. Both will go to their scriptures. And I could add scripture and scripture and scripture upon this. And you would have, you could basically, you could listen to two people argue. You could take a piece of paper. You could say, you could put, uh, you know, position number one on the other side, position number two, draw a line to the middle of the page. And then for position one, list all the scriptures they give you. Position two, list all the scriptures they give you. And then you could look at that and go, uh, wait a minute. So that scripture sounds good, but wait, that scripture seems to be something different. Wait, that scripture, and, and you could find yourself very frustrated. But listen, the frustration does not mean you just throw out the discussion and, or the struggle and you just give up trying to find truth. You still have to find truth. But I just want you to see that right there with the Sabbath, you've got Colossians 2, you've got Exodus 20, apparently, at least on the surface, now again, I'm not trying to do a full-blown teaching here, so I don't want 500 emails trying to argue a position here. I'm trying to say that everyone will go to a specific scripture. They will build their case with scripture, saying scripture is the authority, but they're going to arrive at very different conclusions. Now, why does that happen? There are a lot of reasons. Number one, when, when people are arriving at their conclusions, you first have to ask, what hermeneutical method did you utilize to come to your conclusion? Because if position one uses one method of hermeneutics, position two is using a different method of hermeneutics, then guess what? We need to stop arguing about the topic. We need to stop arguing about the positions. And we have to argue about the hermeneutical method and see if we can come to an agreed upon hermeneutical method. Because if you are using different hermeneutical methods, in other words, different methods of interpretation, you're not going to arrive at the same conclusion. So first you have to agree on the hermeneutic, then take that hermeneutical method, use it correctly and consistently, and then see now what conclusions do we come to? I think in many cases, you'll come to a far closer, you'll, you'll be a much closer agreement if you have an agreed upon hermeneutic. So that's number one. Number two, everyone brings their presuppositions to the text. So we have to do everything. I, I've got a pair of glasses on right now. You got to take off the glasses and say, okay, I'm going to try to look at this text, not through the lens of my presuppositions, whether you like it or not, you've heard something. There's a certain way you think when you pick up that Bible, you probably have already come to some kind of conclusion or you think a certain way about the whole Sabbath question. You got to lay that aside and try to go back to the text. I think that's important. Number three, it's always important to consider how have people viewed the, the uh, passage throughout church history trying to see the different perspectives, trying to hear the different perspectives. So I think there's a, there's a couple of things that we can do to try to, to eliminate some of those problems, but you have to work through some of those issues. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to consider the Sabbath, and we're going to first look at four views. All right, let me, let me, uh, let me grab my notes here. Hopefully I saved them. Hopefully they're saved here. Give me one second. Here we go. Yes, I, I, I knew I had them in my notes somewhere, okay? Here we go. 
four views. Now, I've kind of articulated a little bit uh, what they, those views are, but let me try to give you the four views, okay? Here we go. The first view, we'll call this the seventh day view. The seventh day view. The seventh day view argues that the fourth commandment is a moral law of God requiring us to keep the seventh day Saturday holy. It must therefore remain the day of rest and worship for Christians. All right. This is the seventh day view. Some may call it seventh day Adventist view. Just call it the, because to be fair, now this is very important. And this is a very important distinction. Just because someone holds to a seventh day Sabbath view, in other words, saying that Saturday is the Sabbath and that's the day that, you know, we should worship and that's the day we should rest and that it's a moral law and that it's still binding. Someone could hold to that and still reject the seventh day Adventist movement, doctrine, theology as a church. In other words, they may not even be a part of the Seventh Seventh Day Adventist church. Now, it would be very difficult if they're going to hold to the Seventh Day view and not be a member of the Seventh Day Adventist church, because I don't know where you're going to go to church at that point, okay? Where are you going to go to church? Because now you, what you may do is say, okay, personally on the on Saturday, I'm going to keep that as a Sabbath personally, and then my church meets on Sunday, and I'll go to church to worship on Sunday. But for personally, on Saturday, I'm going to keep it as a Sabbath. I guess you could, uh, could do it that way. But I just want to make sure you realize, just because someone holds to that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a part of the Seventh Ad, Ad, Seventh-day Adventist church. Typically, 90, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, they are going to be, I would say, a, a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And at that point, the, the, the minute you find out someone's a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, in my estimation, I don't even, let's stop and let's not even argue about the Sabbath. There's a, let's talk about the history, the or, origin of Seventh-day Adventist, uh, Adventist church. Let's look at all the other doctrines. Let's look at all the other theology. Let's, while hermeneutic uh, dominates the Seventh-day Adventist church, that we could get into a host of other issues before we even get to the Sabbath, all right? So let's just, let's try to separate this view from the Seventh-day Adventist church because the minute you connect it with the Seventh-day Adventist church, I, I believe at that point, I'm not even going to argue the Sabbath with you. Let's talk about the history, the origin of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Let's talk about what it's believed, its theology, its hermeneutic. We're going we're gonna to deal with the movement before we deal with one of the beliefs of a movement. Okay, I, th- I, think, that, I think that makes sense. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So again, let me give you this view. Here's view number one, all right? It's called the Seventh-day view, which argues the fourth commandment is a moral law of God requiring us to keep the seventh day Saturday. Keep the seventh day Saturday holy. It must therefore remain the day of rest and worship for Christians, all right? View number two, and these views have been summarized by, um, I don't even know the name of the author, um, Justin Taylor. Justin Taylor is the one who summarized the views that I'm referencing, but then he's summarizing the views taken from a book. Okay, so so he's summarizing the views that are found in a book. I'm su- I'm summarizing the views uh, uh, that were summarized by Justin Taylor. All right, we, we, we have to track down where, like, what's the original source, but we'll get to the ultimate, the original sur- source is a certain book, and we're going to be giving away copies of that book here in a minute. All right, so, so there's the first view, the seventh day view. View number two, uh, we'll call this the Christian Sabbath view. The Christian Sabbath view. The Christian Sabbath view basically argues that ever since the resurrection of Christ, the one day in seven to be kept holy is Sunday, the first day of the week. So this will argue there is a Sabbath. We are to keep the Sabbath. We are to remember the Sabbath. We are to keep it holy. But the Sabbath since the resurrection of Christ is now on Sunday and Sunday should be kept as a Sabbath day. As a Sabbath day. Now, there are lots of Christians who worship on Sunday, but they don't keep it as a, sa- a Sabbath. They don't, they don't treat it as a Sabbath. They don't remember it as a Sabbath. They just view get up, go to church, and then do whatever we want to do. You can do the rest of the day, whatever you want. Watch sports, go shopping, do whatever you want, go out to eat. Maybe you'll come back to church Sunday night. 
You may not even do that. In fact, the church may not even have a Sunday evening service. But so there's many Christians who worship on Sunday, but they don't believe that it's a Sabbath. They don't treat it as a Sabbath with any rules or regulations or restrictions, all right? So you have the seventh day view and you have the Christian Sabbath view that Sunday is a Sabbath and should be treated as such, all right? Third view, we'll call this the Lutheran view. We'll call this the Lutheran view. The Lutheran view is that the Sabbath commandment was given to Jews alone and does not concern Christians. Rest and worship are still required, but are not tied to a particular day. Yes, you need to worship. Yes, you need to rest, but it's not tied to a particular day. And the Sabbath was given to the Jews alone. Now, if you want to hear, well, there's probably a number of of, of books that would articulate the view in proper and prob- probably greater detail. But I right here next to me, I just realized it's sitting here. I have Luther's small catechism. I didn't realize it was sitting here at the table. So let me look here really quick. Luther's small catechism. Page 59. Page 59. This is a section where Luther is breaking down the Ten Commandments. All right. And I'll just show you how Luther handles this because this is the Lutheran view takes kind of what Luther did here. And then, of course, it's built upon. Now, Luther, I probably wrote more about the Sabbath than than obviously he's going to articulate here in his small catechism. And you can probably look up Martin Luther on the Sabbath and find out his his views here. But here's how it's uh, detailed or how it's taught in the catechism. Third commandment, God's word. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Thou shalt sanctify the holy day. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we may not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So his his understanding of of the commandment is simply that you uh, you need to fear and love God and you should not despise the preaching of God's word, and you should hold it sacred, and you should gladly hear hear it and learn from it. That's all he does with it. But what does he go on to say? Okay, here we go. Here's the next question. Does God require that we Christians of the New Testament observe the Sabbath Saturday and other holy days of the Old Testament? Here we go. Here's what Luther says. He does not, for in the New Testament, the Sabbath and other holy days were abolished by God himself. And then they quote Colossians 2, 16 and 17. And and then it goes on to say, uh, did God command us, did God command us Christians to observe any day? God did not command us Christians to observe any day. Then he quotes Romans 14, 5 through 6. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. Then Galatians 4, 10 through 11. You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Galatians 4, 10 through 11. And if you know anything about the book of Galatians, Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, where the what sometimes referred to as the Judaizers had come into the church, almost trying to get the church to go back to Judaism. And he's like, hey, you observe days, months, times, and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed upon you labor in vain. Hey, I've tried to show you you're no longer in bondage to that. Why are you going back to it? Now, some would say he's not referring to the Sabbath there. He's referring to other things. I understand that. I'm just trying to show you what Luther did. Um, okay, yeah, there we go. And then he, he continues on, but that, that's the basic argument. So that's the, that's the third view. We'll call that the Lutheran view or Luther's view. And it basically says that the Sabbath was given to the Jews alone and does not concern Christians. Yes, we're to worship. We are to rest and worship. It's still required, but it's not tied to any particular day. Okay, now that raises all kinds of questions about Sunday and how should we do things. All right, so let's go through these views again. Number one, the seventh day view, which says that the commandment is a moral law 
of God requiring us to keep this keep Saturday as holy, and we it must remain the day of rest and worship for Christians. It's a Sabbath day, treated as a Sabbath. Then you've got the Christian Sabbath view that no, the Sabbath rules are still in effect, but they fall on a Sunday, and therefore Sunday should be restricted, and you should only do this, and you can't do this, and you can only do this, and you can't do this, and that those rules are still binding. The Lutheran view. That was just for the Jews, not for us. The New Testament, God abolishes it. We're not bound by it anymore, right? And then you have the fourth view, which is known as the fulfillment view. The fulfillment view is this. Christ has brought the true Sabbath rest into the present. Sabbath commands of the Old Testament are no longer binding on believers. That yes, there is a Sabbath. And when you are in Christ, you are experiencing that Sabbath. You're living that Sabbath out in Christ. He is our Sabbath rest. We can rest in Christ. Therefore, the Sabbath was pointing to Christ. Christ brought in the Sabbath through his death, burial, and resurrection by putting our faith in him. Now we rest in his finished work. We rest in his obedience. We rest in his obedience to the law. And now it's all been fulfilled and we are no longer bound to it, all right? That's the Christ fulfillment view, all right? Those are four views. I'm not telling you which one is right. I'm not here to tell you which one is wrong. I'm telling you, you need to be aware of those four views, and guess what you're going to find when you read about those four views? Everyone's going to have their scripture. Everyone's going to quote from the Bible. Everyone's going to say, see, that scripture proves it, and then someone else is going to say, nope, that scripture doesn't prove it. Nope, that's nope, that scripture doesn't prove it. And guess what? It, 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 you can go on and on and on and on and on and argue and argue and argue. And it that drives me crazy because I like to think the truth is there. We should all be able to open our Bibles. We should be able to read it, interpret it, and come to a conclusion. But the sad state, the sad reality is 2,000 years of church history, and guess what? We still have completely different schools of thought completely different views, all claiming that the views are based off scripture alone. Now, let me tell you again, what are some of the issues? What are some of the factors to consider? First, you have to say, what is the hermeneutic that everyone is using? Is everyone using the same hermeneutic? If they're not using the same hermeneutic, you cannot expect to come to the same conclusions. You just no, no way, just no way for that to happen. And then also you have to acknowledge that everyone comes to the text with presuppositions. So you have to do your best to throw off presuppositions and then consider every view and, and figure out what is going on. You have to, you have to do that. And you, and you have to constantly be re-examining your position. I mean, th- these are just some basic things that we have to consider. So why are we talking about it this morning? Well, the other day, my phone rang and I picked up the phone and uh, an individual was calling me who had discovered us on the Pandora st- music streaming app. Now, first of all, I was excited as excited to, as I could be that someone who listens to us on Pandora contacted us because if you look at Pandora, um, you know, I, I don't know. I could look today. In fact, let me just, I'll just tell you, I just I said to speculate. Let me just tell you, let me pull up the statistics really quick. Let me pull them up. It'll only take a second here. Let's go to our podcasting hosting site. Here we go. Let's go to Spreaker. Let's go to statistics. All right. Let's go see more. Let's look here. All right. Let's go to sources. Here's where we are. Um, Pandora. Oh, okay. Today, Pandora. Okay. Here's, here's the apps where people are listening to us the most in the last 24 hours. Apple is number one to, uh, today. Spreaker is number two. Deezer is number three. We've never had anyone contact us who listened to us on Deezer. We've never. Number four is Pandora. So Pandora has made it up there. Then Spotify. So Pandora has made it to number four today. Uh, sometimes it's number three. Sometimes it's number five. So that, that that makes up a lot of people listening to us on Pandora. And we've just never received anything. Not not so much as an email, not a phone call, nothing. So I got I get a phone call and it's someone who discovered us on Pandora. And I'm like, wow, that's that's awesome. And he had found some. I don't know if you remember. Um, I don't even remember how long ago it was. 
uh, someone who came across our YouTube channel started making some kind of arguments about Sunday that, you know, you worship on Sunday, you worship on Sunday. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I tried to engage the person. I, you know, I look in every broadcast. What do I give you? I give you my email address. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. And you all know that there are different, you, you've seen it on social media. Some people want to engage in a discussion and some people just want to attack and engage in a debate. And, and when I say engage in a debate, what they want is they want the opportunity to use your timeline or to use the comments on your YouTube channel or use the comments wherever simply to put forth their position while basically calling your na- you names or insulting you. They don't actually want to engage with you. They don't want to actually have a lengthy discussion. It's just like, no, I'm going to use your timeline to put forth my position because I don't really want to listen to you. I don't want to actually engage you. I just want to tell you that you're wrong. I'm right. And here's my position. Well, as soon as you start kind of detecting that is what someone is doing, it really, it really, from a biblical perspective, it's foolish to engage in that because you're just going to end up looking foolish and you're going to end up probably saying things to that person or attacking that person. You're going to end up handling yourself in an ungodly position. So you always have to know when to just say, time out, done, I quit, I'm, I'm, I'm walking away. Even if, if that other person perceives that they've won, great, who cares? It's not about winning a debate. See, once you get into a discussion and it becomes about winning a debate, I believe you've already lost. Because winning a debate is about who can, you know, I can ask this question, I can ask this question, I can make this argument to try to catch you, to try to trip you up, to try to, I'm, le- I'm asking questions to lead you into a trap so that I can, I can say, gotcha. And once it, that starts, then the pursuit of truth is gone. Now you've already taken a side and all you want to do is win your argument. All you want to do is win. And as soon as that happens, you've got to just realize it's time to walk away. It's just, you're not going to accomplish anything. But someone on YouTube was kind of doing this. And so I came to the church. I think I did one, maybe we did two sermons, maybe three sermons that were kind of an impromptu on the spot. Hey, this person's attacking us for worshiping on Sunday you know, that we're part of the great, you know, conspiracy of the Roman Catholic Church to abandon the Sabbath and all all of those kind of accusations. And I was like, okay, I think this person is Seventh-day Adventist. The person would never really acknowledge whether they were or weren't, but it it became pretty obvious and so that they didn't really want to discuss it. So what did I do? I I perceived that they were Seventh-day Adventists. So I started with kind of the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church going, look, this church has got multiple problems before we even get to the Sabbath. And then I did just kind of a brief, quick overview of some basic Sabbath issues and questions. Wasn't meant to be a full in-depth teaching, but we did a little bit of work just to bring the subject up. And part of me wanted to just get the answer out there so I could stop going back and forth with the person. Now, the person basically just walked away and, you know, never contacted me by email, never wanted to have a meaningful discussion. So, uh, but, you know, those messages are out there and I'm assuming they're on Pandora. So this individual found at least one of those messages, some of those messages. I don't remember how many he found. I don't remember all the details. But he contacted me. Now, I think when he originally contacted me, I think think maybe he, he, he originally contacted me possibly to try to maybe more like he wanted to tell me where I was wrong. But but it only took like a minute or two, and it turned into a very cordial, respectful conversation. He had he shared a lot of very important thoughts and perspectives. He definitely holds to the Sabbath being on Saturday. He didn't tell me all the rules that go with it, how binding the rules are. Let's say if you have someone in your church and they don't follow the Sabbath rule correctly, does is that grounds for church discipline? Because in the Old Testament you would be killed for it. So. I'll Obviously, we're not going to kill someone in the New Testament. So, but you would, are they excommunicated for not following the Sabbath, or are they? Uh, how many warnings do they get? Like, they're, they're, we didn't get into a lot of those very specifics. But he clearly held to a Sabbath Saturday. Well, clearly, obviously, I don't hold to a Sabbath Saturday. Um, obviously, I, we our church meets on Sunday. But I, as I've always said, when you call me or, or bring up a, a different perspective, I immediately start thinking about it. Right. 
I start thinking about it, start thinking about it. And so I, I, we may try to come back and do some more work on this subject. But in the meantime, um, I, one thing I wanted to do is try to find out, the, you know, to try to remind myself of the basic views throughout church history. That's why I just gave them to you. Try to remind myself that the issue may be a hermeneutical one more than it is a Sabbath one. In other words, you got to find out what the, what the hermeneutics that are being used, which hermeneutical method is being used before you can even come to that conclusion. But I also know that I always need to remember that whatever I learned yesterday could have been wrong, so I need to restudy it today, and I need to try to set aside my presuppositions. So um, I just started doing a little bit of research, started working, you know, okay, maybe I'll do a little bit of this, read a little bit of this, and I came across two important books, two important books. Those books have been added to the Theology Central Book Club. Now, if you want to join the Theology Central Book Club, it's absolutely free. You don't have to purchase anything, and I don't get any money. Just go to theologycentral.net. Look at the drop-down menu. You'll see a right there in the menu, Theology Central Book Club. Click on that. It will take you to the link that will take you to the Theology Central Book Club. Why would you join? Because whenever I'm reading a book, whether I agree with a book or disagree with a book, if I think it's interesting, I will suggest it. You get notified, oh, a new book has been suggested, and you can look at it. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to buy it through Amazon. You don't have to do anything, but at least it keeps you, it's another way to communicate with you of what books I'm looking at, what books I'm reading, what books I'm hearing something about. I think they're interesting, and then I put them there. Doesn't mean I agree with every book that is suggested. No way, shape, or form. I trust that you are an adult and that you are smart and that you can you can read the books and make determinations of, of what you think or, or, or whether you agree or disagree. And as always, I'm available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and then I'll go, okay, that's an interesting question about that book. And if I need to, I'll come here, turn on the microphone, and we'll talk about it, all right? So, so this individual called, it was a great conversation, great conversation, very encouraging. Even though we had difference of opinion, even though we there was a disagreement, it was respectful, godly, edifying. I think it was beneficial. It was encouraging to me. I hope it was beneficial and encouraging to the person who was listening. And, and that's just one of those things you're like, see, that's how Christians can disagree on something and still maintain a godliness. He didn't do a drive-by comment. He didn't just, you know, put me on full blast. He called to have a, a meaningful dialogue, which I greatly respect. Even if I don't necessarily agree at the moment, I'm always willing to change my view. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm willing to change my view. I've changed my view on a lot of things in my Christian life. You've heard You've been listening over the last few years, being moving away from more of a lordship view because I began to reject certain aspects of it. You've witnessed some of those changes in real time. I tended to be more amillennial. I'm kind of moving away from an amillennial position. So you, you've you noticed some of those changes because I know that whatever I believe, it's, I, you know, I'm fallible. I'm fallible. So I'm constantly re-examining, constantly re-examining, constantly really re-examining. So... I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get a, a, a little bit, do a little bit of research, and I came across two important books. Now, one book, many argues, the Seventh Day View is 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 better explained, or how would I say this? Some would argue that in one of the books, the Seventh Day View really is the one that makes the most sense in that book. So I wanted to get a book that some people say the seventh day view, it, it kind of wins the argument in this book and then get a book where others go, no, the seventh day argument is kind of defeated in this book. So I wanted to bring two books that gives a lot of history, a lot of different perspectives, and that there are some say the seventh day argument wins and some say the seventh day argument doesn't win and just bring all of that together and do a book giveaway. Now, here is the issue. First and foremost, these books are expensive. So I cannot give away that many, but I can give away some because one of our listeners just sent me a check the other day. And so I'm going to use that to try to benefit and bless some other people. So first of all, the, uh, here, I'm going to give you the name of the books. I'm going to give you the name of the books. Let me pull them up really quick. All right. The first one, 
I'm going to click on it. Here we go. The first one is called Perspectives on the Sabbath, Four Views. Perspectives on the Sabbath, Four Views. Those four views that I gave you, well, I was reading someone's summary of the four views, and those four views are there are, are then laid out in this book. And please note, this book is 400 pages. 400 pages. Now, I could, if it would be great if I could purchase you a Kindle version, but I don't think I can purchase you the Kindle version. If you have a Kindle, it's only $10. So the Kindle version is very cheap, but I would challenge you to go to Theology Central, the book club, and, 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 and buy the Kindle version if you can. But if you would like a paperback version, you can contact me at newsif at yahoo.com newsif at yahoo.com, and I will give away as many as I can. All right. Now, to the person who called me uh, on Pandora, if you will email me, newsif at yahoo.com, explain that you're the one who talked to me, I will send you a copy of the book, okay, free. Don't want anything from you. Don't, don't need, all I will need is your first and last name and a good address to send the book to, mailing address with zip code, city, state, all of that information. And then we, I will order it immediately and have it shipped directly to you. It will come from Amazon to you. And um, there, there you have it. We don't want anything from you. We don't want, we don't want, I don't, I'm not going to put you on some mailing list. You're not going to get bothered every week asking for donations. We don't do that. Just want to send the book to you for free. Again, it's called Perspectives on the Sabbath, Four Views. Again, it's 400 pages long. And uh, we will send you a, a copy. Again, it's uh, it's crazy how expensive the paperback is. The paperback is $26.61. Um, and that one, and that, I think that's even a used copy. The new copy, uh, which is crazy. If I want a new one, it's $115. <laughs> it's $115. So I will send you a used version. Uh, now, I will be looking on other uh, other sites. If I can find a copy of this book for cheaper, then I will send it to you from there. Um, so, But um, let, let us know if you want a, a copy of the book. If anyone else out there wants a copy of the book, please email me at newsif at yahoo.com. I will do my very best to get one to you. Um, We'll, we'll do our best. Again, if, if you if the Kindle version is only $9.99, that's the way to, to go. But I can't, I don't think I can uh, purchase the Kindle version for you. Um, I don't think I can send the Kindle version to you as a gift. I don't, I don't think it's possible. Um, yeah, I don't, maybe I can. Let's see here. Give me a second. I'm looking. Oh, I can. All right. So I can send you a Kindle version. All right. Um, I can. Uh, so uh, if you if you want a Kindle version, I can send this directly to you. I will need your email. I just need your email and it will send you a link uh, to it. I don't know how it works for your Kindle. I don't know. But even if you don't have a Kindle, if you have the Kindle app, uh, you can download the Kindle app for your tablet or phone and you could read it that way. So um, I could I could send that uh I could do that as well. So uh, if you want, if you want a Kindle version, uh, in fact, that's what we'll do. Well, if, if you if you want the Kindle version again for your app, just email me at newsif at yahoo.com. Say I would like the Kindle version of Perspectives on the Sabbath. I will I will download. I will send that to you. Um, and uh, there you go. And that that's because it's only ten dollars, and we can give away more that way. The the paperback. I mean, it's almost $30, and that's for a used copy. That's for a used copy. Again, a new copy is $115. Clearly, I can't give away a new copy, all right? So um, that's one thing we can do. Bottom line is, if you want perspectives on the Sabbath for views, email me at newsif at yahoo.com, and I will find a way to try to get you a copy of the book, all right? There you go. So uh, that's called Perspectives on the Sabbath. Now, I'm going to go back. To our book club, there's one other book. And this one is 444 pages. This one is called From Sabbath to Lord's Day, A Biblical, Historical, and Theological Investigation. From Sabbath to to Lord's Day, A Biblical, Historical, and Theological Investigation. 
This one um, is $30, so it's expensive. There is no Kindle version, so I would have to uh, send this to you. If you want to call, and again, to the person who called me, who listens to me on Pandora, you email me at newsif at yahoo.com. And again, I will send you the paperback version of this book free. We don't want anything from it. Anybody else who wants a copy of this book, email me, newsif at yahoo.com, and I will do what I can to get you a copy as soon as possible. All right? So let me give you the name of the books again. Number one, From Sabbath to Lord's Day, A Biblical, Historical, and Theological Investigation. From Sabbath to Lord's Day, A Biblical, Historical, and Theological Investigation by D.A. Carson. It is 444 pages long, and it's an in-depth study of a lot of the issues surrounding the Sabbath debate and controversy. It's Some will say it's very academic, but I, I, I believe that obviously anyone listening, if they're willing to do the work, can, can read the book and understand it, okay? And then the other book is uh, Perspectives on the Sabbath, Four Views. Now, that one, I think, we'll have to give away. We'll have to give away the Kindle version there. So, but again, you don't have to have a Kindle. You can just download the Kindle app, and then I can uh, send you the uh, digital copy. If you would like a copy of the book, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I will try to get. I will try to make that happen for you today. I will try to do what I can to to help you out to to get these books in your hands, um, any way that I can. Again, for the person who called me, who was listening on Pandora, if they're still listening to me, please email me. Let me know that you're the one who called, and we'll get these books to you as any way that I can as soon as possible. I am. I apologize that we are limited in resources here. So I can't just give away hundreds and hundreds of copies. But the reason these copies are being given away is because of a listener from Ohio who once again sent a check and be, we're going to use that money to benefit other people. That's what I want to do. I'm going to use that, that money uh, to get to well, try to get books in the, in the hands of people over an issue where there are so many different views. Everyone claiming the Bible teaches it. So I'm going to hand this to you and then you can dive in and start reading. You still may come to the person who called from Pandora. You may still arrive at the conclusion that the seventh day view is correct. That's fine. You may come to a conclusion that it's not correct. That's fine. The key is just, I want to give you resources to help you in your pursuit of truth. All right. And uh, there, there you go. All right, now there's far more. I feel like I should say a lot more, but we've already been on the air for 52 minutes, so we'll have to stop. There you have it, all right? Any questions? If you're confused by, okay, which book can I get? Just if you have any questions, just email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com, and we'll do our very best to help you out. There you have it. And, oh, and if you want to, again, if you want to read more about Luther's view, uh, Luther's small catechism, you may be able to find it online for free. And then you could probably just do a Google search for Martin Luther on the Sabbath. And you'll probably, and just make sure it's Martin Luther from the 1500s, not not, not Mar, Martin Luther uh, King Jr. Um, obviously very different. Okay. So um, you can... Uh, you can do some of your own research there. Just I'm not saying you should agree with Luther's view, but at least you can, I mean, that's an important view in church history. So you can at least see it. All right. There you have it. Thanks for listening. I'll be back on the air shortly with some more discussions. And hopefully this was beneficial. As always, contact me whenever you want. Let me know where you're listening from. That's always so helpful. I, I cannot tell you much how, how helpful it is when someone contacts us and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm your listener. You know, I'm listening to you on this app or I found you this way. I still don't know how people find us. Did you just doing a random search? I mean, you're on Pandora. You're in a Pandora music streaming app. How in the world did you find a discussion about the Sabbath on Pandora? What were you looking for? Like that, that just seems like a weird place to find on Deezer known for, you know, hi-fi, you know, lossless streaming, you know, great sound quality in their music streaming. How did you find us on that? Like, I, I'm always interested. How did you find us on Spotify? You know, how did you find us on Apple Podcast? 
What were you looking for? What were you searching for? So I don't get any of that information. I just know, oh, someone, someone just downloaded, I, 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 you know, in real time, I can go, oh, someone, oh, 10 people just listened to us on Apple Podcast. Okay, great, wonderful. I don't know how you found us. How? How did you come across? Where? What were you looking for? Um, what's your background? You know, because I, I think we have, I think, I personally believe that more, the people who are drawn to this podcast are kind of the outcast of Christianity. They're the ones who find themselves uh, at times, I think, at odds with a lot of things going on within Christianity. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know even know how to, I don't even know how to describe the audience. Like I, I can do a lot of speculating, like what, who are the people who listen? Why do they listen? What, you know, how many different the- theology podcasts do they listen to? What, what, what lane do they put us in? Do they put us in, oh, that's a train wreck. And I just like to hear the train wreck. Like, I don't know. So anytime you want to just let us know anything, you, it's, it's great. When I say us, anytime you want to let me know, just email me at newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll stop right there. Oh, please remember theologycentral.net theologycentral.net, the blog section. Please be checking the blog section each and every day because each and every day when I'm listening to podcasts, when I come across something interesting, I grab it and I place it right there. Many cases I embed it so that you can just listen right there. Sometimes I have to provide a link um, if I can't find an embed code, but it's right there, please just check. And I think you'll find plenty of interesting things. And if I come across some interesting discussions on the Sabbath uh, while I'm listening to some podcast, I may um, I may grab it and throw uh, an embed code if I can find an embed code and uh, place it right there on the theologycentral.net pod page under the blog section. And listen, if you're listening to a podcast somewhere and you're like, oh, this is a great episode, just send me the information. If I can find an embed code for it, I may just throw it on the on the blog section for other people to listen to. Because look, I may throw things on there whether I agree or disagree, but I think that they're interesting, which then keeps the conversation going. And just remember, when you go to the Theology Central pod page, I'm still looking for the first person to do this. When you scroll up at the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to see a little circle. It's kind of orange and has a white microphone. You tap on that white microphone and you can leave us a voicemail. We still want someone to leave us a voicemail because I don't know how it works. So it's a new feature. We want to see if it works. So leave us a voicemail. And of course, you can leave us a five-star rating and a review right there as well. Okay, I'll stop. Everyone have a great day. Thanks for listening. God bless.